Well, good morning and welcome to uh, the first session of this program on cosmology uh, and infinities. This uh, program here is part of a longer and larger collaboration between philosophers of science and physicists in Oxford and here in Cambridge. And uh, in America, there is a complementary program involving Rutgers and Columbia and Santa Cruz uh, and uh, other universities. And the idea of the program as a whole is to try to draw together philosophers of science and cosmologists uh, to discuss and understand areas of mutual interest or areas where we think uh, there is great benefit to be had by better education uh, on one side to the other. The next of these programs will be in Oxford and will be about quantum cosmology. One of the past ones was also in Oxford and was on the arrow of time. So this particular meeting is focusing on infinities in cosmology. Infinities are a subject with a colourful and highly controversial history both in philosophy and in physics. Of course there are three varieties that you might think about, uh, mathematical, uh, physical uh, and then something much more nebulous that you might call transcendental. Uh, mathematical infinities uh, we know about up until uh, Cantor's work in the last quarter of the 19th century. Mathematicians were not willing to regard infinities as actual mathematical objects which you could move around and manipulate. They thought that that might hide some deep contradiction uh, within mathematical logic uh, which when set loose would undermine the entire subject, allowing you to prove that anything was true. And so Cantor himself had a very difficult time introducing uh, his idea of transfinite numbers and different categories of infinity, and was pretty much banished from the subject uh, for some significant period, and he went off and worked on the history of mathematics before eventually uh, returning to mathematics. Uh, ironically, the people who really embraced his ideas were not mathematicians at all. They were Catholic theologians who saw that his ideas of having many levels of infinity, uh, each quite distinct from the other, were just what they were looking for to enable them to talk about God as an absolute infinity and yet be free to talk about every other type of infinity in mathematics and physics uh, at the same time. Well, when we do physics or cosmology, we never seem to have to bother about anything more complicated than the first two types of infinity, the countable uh, and the uncountable or the continuum. We'll see that uh, in some of these talks that these types of counting problems still do raise their heads in cosmology, the ongoing problem of how to find a probability measure for the multiverse, for eternal inflation, is ultimately bound up with this type of counting problem. You can count how many universes uh, you make, as it were, in the eternal inflation scenario, <clears throat> but the way in which you do the counting determines the answer that you get. Uh, and worse still, uh, whereas in ordinary problems there might be some type of natural order to allow you to do the counting in one way, uh, the so-called problem of time in general relativity removes the possibility of having that nice natural ordering. The other area where we come across those fundamental issues is in issues of computability, the so-called halting problem, and we'll hear a little about that in how you mine out and try to systematically compute the structure, say, of the landscape in string theory, or study space-times where it is possible in principle for an infinite number of things to happen in a finite time. So you could send your laptop on a space-time trip and it would come back having carried out an infinite number of computations. So space-times that are familiar to physicists, like ADS, have that property. But what about physical infinities? That's probably what we will be more engaged with. As with many things, Aristotle made the key important distinction uh, in this area, that we should distinguish between so-called potential infinities, so listings that don't have an end, like the natural numbers, and actual infinities. So an infinite temperature, an infinite density, something that could manifest itself in your universe here locally. And Aristotle maintained that there couldn't be any actual infinities in nature, 
closely linked to that also is his veto on the appearance of any vacuum uh, or void. And the two were intimately linked because in a vacuum he believed there would be no resistance to motion and you would accelerate to infinite speed. Well, uh, are there physical infinities? In general relativity, uh, people tend to take a different attitude to infinities than they have in particle physics. If you're a particle physicist or an aerodynamicist and you see an infinity, your first reaction is, must try harder, as your school report used to say. Uh, that something has gone wrong with your theory, something is missing, it's incomplete, and if you model the situation better, if you add viscosity of air to your aerodynamics problem, uh, that infinity in the velocity gradient will go away. And particle physics uh, had a long history of trying to deal with infinities in that way. And the great acclaim and success that string theory uh, seemed to have in the early days in the 1980s was very much built upon the fact that it claimed to be able to resolve the problem of infinities uh, that field theories were beset with. But what about in gravitation? We know only since 1972 that Newtonian gravity contains uh, quite nasty finite time singularities. So it was discovered only in 1972, to dynamicists' great surprise, that having five point particles in Newtonian gravity, four of them in a pair of counter-rotating binaries, uh, and a lighter particle oscillating between their centre of gravity, this system expands to infinite size in a finite time. So this problem arises because the particles are point-like. And so the gravitational forces between particles separated by R can become infinitely large as R goes to zero. Now in a sort of uh, foreshadowing of things like cosmic censorship, interestingly, general relativity avoids that problem. If you try to get even point particles too close together, a horizon forms around them, and you're protected from those type of unbounded gravitational forces and the infinities at finite time that arise in Newtonian theory. So in general relativity, there's actually a maximum force given by speed of light to the fourth power divided by big G. So the Planck unit of force in uh, gravitation doesn't involve Planck's constant. It's classical, and it's the maximum force that you can feel. It's the tension of a cosmic string that's got an opening angle of 360 degrees, if you like. Well, in general relativistic cosmology, we know the long history of singularities. How do we characterize them? Uh, why it's not wise, perhaps, to characterize them primarily in terms of infinities in any physical quantity, but in terms of geodesic incompleteness, and then to try to prove theorems that show that infinities of a particular well-defined sort may accompany those incomplete geodesics. And more recently, we found that there can be other types of much weaker singularity where you don't have geodesic incompleteness but you have infinities of pressure uh, or acceleration, so so-called sudden singularities. Well then locally you might ask can these sorts of singularities arise locally and we know the famous problem of cosmic censorship uh, as to whether nature always conspires to hide singularities in general relativity behind visibility horizons. Curiously, there's a completely analogous uh, problem, uh, really in medieval science, uh, which uh, surrounded this problem of the vacuum. So for the medievals, it was regarded as it should be impossible for a vacuum to be created locally in the universe. And lots of medieval physics was about uh, an argument as to how it might be or it might not be that a vacuum could be created. If you drop something on the ground, it was in contact with the ground instantaneously, when it separated, was there a momentary creation of a perfect vacuum before the air came in? And people would carry out thought experiments, uh, people like Burley, uh, Roger Bacon, Blasius, uh, as to whether this was possible. And one of the arguments in their armory was something called the celestial agent. 
So it's a complete analogue of the cosmic sensor. The celestial agent was supposed to intervene or organise the laws of nature in such a way that a perfect vacuum could never appear and be visible. Well, in modern times we don't have celestial agent, we have the cosmic sensor and uh, Kylas de Fermat will tell us something about that later on. So the big question in a sense is, are physical infinities always just artifacts of an incomplete theory or are they real, are they essential in some way? Roger Penrose has argued for a long time that singularities, infinities in cosmology in the initial state are essential for setting some sort of boundary condition. So is that right? Uh, elsewhere in cosmology, as we'll hear about in the first talk, there are potential infinities that people often don't worry about so much. Infinite volume, infinite action, infinite age possibly. Should we worry about those potential infinities uh, in cosmology and in particular in quantum cosmology? Do they provide some sort of barrier to formulating a self-consistent quantum cosmological picture? Well, that's enough for me. I've just given you a snapshot of some of the areas of overlap between philosophy of science and cosmology where these issues arise. And our first speaker, George Ellis, uh, is going to talk about uh, infinities of age and size and tomorrow I think he's going to move on and talk about small universes and topology uh, and so forth. Thanks George. <laughs>